It's been 150 years since a British dentist named Stent uh, implanted a foreign body in a patient's gum. And I think little did he know at that time that uh, a whole revolutionary field that uh, was truly, you know, to use a, an overused word, disruptive in the field of cardiovascular medicine began and carried his name forward. I think very few people know the origin of the term stent. But nonetheless, uh, it's absolutely a pleasure to introduce Dr. El Pesh Shah, whom I'm very proud to say is someone I've trained, who's uh, risen to uh, uh, really a tremendous level of excellence in clinical cardiology, and particularly in interventional cardiology, who's going to talk to us about design of coronary stents, some of the things that we've all found confusing, and some of the things that we all really need to know. Um, today, um, I'll be presenting uh, the talk on coronary stand design. Um, I think coronary stand has evolved over the last 20 odd years. It has become the backbone of all the innovations and, and, and the success we have had in the field of interventional cardiology. These are my financial disclosures. So we got to start with balloon angioplasty because that's kind of how we, this is all started. However, right away within balloon angioplasty era, we realized that we had certain challenges, and that included abrupt vessel closure, where you open up an artery, and right away it will close down. Several of those patients required open heart bypass surgery. We're talking about 1970s. Not only patients who survived and did fine and went home after three, five days, we realized they would re So 30 to 50 percent of those patients continue to have restenosis, almost sometimes half of those patients. And that led to a very high revascularization rates of 20 to 30 percent. And the whole reason this was happening was because of this immediate uh, recoil, which was followed by further neointimal proliferation. So there was really nothing which was keeping the artery open. And that's where the advent, the idea of stent came along. And we started with metallic stents, what we call now bare metal stents. Uh, the restenosis improved significantly from 30 to 50 percent down to 20 to 30 percent. And the stand trials called Benistead and Stress and all of those trials confirmed all of those things. And by late 90s, almost 80 percent of those stents were bare metal stents, and that's how we were doing angioplasties. And the reason this would work is this would this particular stent scaffold would prevent that immediate recoil which was happening after just doing a balloon angioplasty. However, we still continue to have new intimal proliferation, which landed up causing further restenosis. We have at our institution been involved in stent trials for years uh, with Dr. Reisner, Dr. Flamin. So this has been part of the uh, Methodist Debicki uh, history and, and stent evaluation. We've been there every step of the way. With bare metal stents, we realized there was some new disease entity. It is called in stent restenosis or ISR. And then for several years, we spent a lot of energy in treating ISR, whether we did brachytherapy, which, by the way, as some of you know, we still do them, which is radiation inside those stents, rotational arthritis, and cutting balloons. And we spent so much energy for the first five, seven years trying to figure out how to handle those in-stent restenosis. Because often our surgeons would say, well, you guys are not doing stents. You're doing stunts in this, in this cath lab. So it was kind of very personal to us after a while. That being said and done, we realized that this is not good enough. That we have to find a mechanism where we can prevent restenosis, where we can prevent, quote unquote, their scar tissue from forming inside a very well deployed stent. And that basically came to drug eluting stents. What drug eluting stent does is basically a metal stent, just like a regular bare metal stent, but it is coated with a drug. And that drug is non or anti proliferative, anti restenotic, and that once uh, the lumen is established with the stent. It, down the road, whether three months, six months, it will prevent uh, further restenosis response and basically keep the artery wide open. So we kind of enjoyed that success. And from the 1970s to 80s, 90s, and early 2000, we realized that we, we started getting rid of failures. Failures were the first thing we kind of uh, got over it, where we were able to deliver stents, where we were able to open up arteries. So from almost 40%, uh, by the late 90s, we were already down to 10% of failure rates. What also helped us with drug eluting stents is the restenosis rate. So once bare metal stents came, it went down, but there was a significant drop again after the, after the introduction of drug eluting stent, which was probably one of the most singular major event. The drug eluting stents, what we call first generation, these are the ones we started doing in the early 2000s and mid 2000s. There were two varieties. 
taxes and cipher. Uh, taxes uh, itself is a paclitaxel coated drug. That's the name of the drug which is used uh, on a liberty stand. And cipher is, uses sirolimus, one of the olimus drugs, uh, again on a velocity stand. And those are the drug molecules is used on those first generation drugs uh, stents. The data compared to bare metal stent was superior in everything we could see, whether it is against uh, paclitaxel versus bare metal stents or sirolimus against bare metal stent. The TLR was definitely much, much lower in all the drug eluting stent arms. So there was no doubt that we were doing better than bare metal stents uh, come middle of 2000. However, as a lot of things would happen, you start using more and more stents, you start realizing some of the downfalls, you kind of realize some of the challenges. And one of the challenges we quickly learned was late catch up. So it took about three to five years to realize, but at about five years when we followed up patients who, we, who had a cipher or a Texas implant, we had total MACE event rates almost in the upwards of 20%. So yes, you did fairly well day one, you did fairly well maybe up to one year, but there was a persistent late catch up uh, which, which was a problem. And we started looking into what was causing that late catch-up. I mean, this is very important because I think we, we have moved beyond first generation for this very particular reason. And what we learned was that it was lack of endothelialization. So in this particular paper, which was presented in 2006, you can see the bare metal stents, endothelialization is almost in the upwards of 90% after the first year. So bare metal stents really work very well after the first year. Compared to that, a, a drug eluting stance only, only has about 50 to 60 percent endothelialization. And that's why this sort of a uh, reverse graph we see when it comes to events, whether it's because of stent thrombosis or whatever it may be, but we see that once bare metal stance works, the, the event rates become very stable after the first year. However, with drug eluting stents, we realized, again, mostly with first generation, we realized that there was a continuing increase in event rates after the first year. And that's where the challenge lied. So there was this trade-off. We realized that, yes, uh, there was first generation drug eluting stents. However, we were seeing more and more late stent thrombosis. Bare metal stents, we saw more and more restenosis. So the death and MI rates were really no different in this first generation stent. So we realized we need to have a smarter design to improve outcomes. And that's where the second generation stents came along. So how does one create second generation stents? Well, in, in, there are th key elements of the design which I'm gonna talk about a little bit. So obviously one is revolves around the stent metal choice and the design we choose around that, which drug molecule we choose and the role of polymer. Because there are certain attributes to a stent which we all physicians need. It's not just cr creating something in the lab and saying, well, go and use it, because it's not always easy, because we need access to lesion. So it has to be very deliverable. So it has to be flexible. We, we ought to be able to see it. It has to go across tough lesions. We ought to have good acute outcomes. We don't want to, again, go back to the balloon angioplasty days. So we want accurate, accurate placement, scaffolding. Radial strength is very important. Otherwise, you're going to have immediate recoil. We also want outcomes, whether it's patency, low thrombosis, long-term mechanical integrity. So these are some of the considerations which ought to go into designing any stent, especially a drug eluting stents. Because there are trade-offs. For everything a biomedical engineer does, there are pluses and minuses. So if you want more scaffold, which inherently will give it more strength and radial strength, you're gonna lose out on flexibility and conformability. So something which is very rigid, you probably may not, may not be able to deliver. It may not conform to the vessel shape. Expansion range is very important, but the bigger you want and more it to be expanded, you're gonna lose out on the profile. The profile of the stand is gonna get larger, so it will be hard to deliver. Radio opacity, obviously we wanna see our stands better. However, the more you wanna see, the more the metal you wanna put inside those stands. So those are trade-offs, and you have to design a stand which, which really meets all, which is the middle ground. We started with cho choosing an alloy. So now we are coming to the late uh, middle of 2000 and we are trying to figure out second generation stents. So we went through a selection of alloys and the first choice is always stainless steel. One of the most inert of all the alloys we know of. Uh, it is very biocompatible uh, and very high radio opacity. Beyond stainless steel, there is one new uh, product uh, which uses platinum chromium. Platinum chromium is a little bit like stainless steel except that there is additional addition of platinum which allows for some better uh, deliverability and expansion. But one of the biggest advances is going beyond stainless steel. Uh, 
we found cobalt alloys. Cobalt alloys allows us to make really thin struts and uh, without, without losing out on the radial strength. It also can be seen very well, and again, it is very biocompatible. Currently, we have two cobalt alloys which are approved and used. One is cobalt chromium, other is cobalt nickel. So we said, well, okay, we're gonna select metal and see if we can come up with newest, newer metals. Then we wanted to go back to the design, how we design a stent. In general, in general, there are two ways you can make a stent. You can basically take a wire and, 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 and uh, create multiple segments out of that. Like this is one of the technologies which has been used. So you take a wire, make it sinusoid uh, in a form like a single continuous piece of wire, you wrap it in a helical shape, and then you fuse it at points or links you want to create, depending on how conformable, how flexible, or how stiff you want to make that stent. And that is get, that gets laser fused. So this is one way of making a particular stent where you just take a wire uh, technology. The other way, which is actually used even more commonly, is laser cut. So basically, you're taking a slotted tube and um, a solid tube, and then you basically uh, make uh, holes uh, and create a design of your choice. The give and take of these two method of manufacturing is that the wire-like devices tends to be much more flexible versus the laser cut solid tubes tends to be less flexible, less conformable. But again, um, those are the two ways we started making stents. There are certain key elements in designing the actual structure of a stent. Um, let me spend a few minutes talking about the key elements of this. So we start with the hooves, and there are the red ones, which are the links. So several hooves, hooves makes one ring. You can actually place them in phase, or you can place them out of phase. You can put connecting links, links in the middle uh, to connect all those and create a basically a stent skeleton or a structure of a scaffold. So in phase or out of phase? In phase, as you can see, these are parallel hoops, which basically are in, in uh, synchrony. And this allows for better scaffolding, versus out of phase allows for better flexibility. So it is less rigid, but again, it is, it is asynchronous, so to speak. Crest and bar arm lengths. Crest are, so crest are basically areas uh, which are part of the rings or hoops where if you put fewer crest, you can't expand that stand as much, but the more crest you are able to group together, the more you can expand that particular stand. Bar arms, uh, the shorter the bar arm, the less expansion, and again, the longer the bar arm, the more the expansion. So again, these are some of the technological nuances of how a stand can be designed because there's so much thought which goes into that. Links, probably the most important attribute of how we create a stand. The fewer the links, uh, causes, allows the stand to be more flexible. The more uh, the links, uh, it makes it less flexible and more stiff. So the closed cell design, which really gives us an excellent vessel coverage, unfortunately, also tends to be less flexible. So that's a little trade-off here. The concept of recall is very important. What is a recall? So you put in a basically a cream stand outside, and you take it inside, you inflate your balloon, and that expands the stand. However, as we remove the balloon and deflate the balloon, there is a recoil of this particular stand. And this varies from the choice of metal alloy we have made. So it differs from one to one. What we really would want to see is, is stands with good radial strength. The concept of radial strength is basically when you deflate this balloon, there is persistent strength in this particular stand alloy, which allows it not to collapse. Because radial strength or minimum, uh, minimally compa uh, uh, compliant stands really adapt very well to all the pulsatile forces in the cardiac cycle. The second choices we had to make was in the choice of anti-restenotic drugs. So we talked about the paclitaxel drug, which was using the old first generation stand called Taxus. And now we have moved on to Olimus group of drugs, uh, Sirolimus, Zotarolimus, and Everolimus. The way these drugs work is basically there are two pathways. Uh, the Olimus uh, group of drugs inhibit mTOR, which in turn causes, uh, inhibits smooth muscle cell proliferation, which has been initiated because of inflammation. The paclitaxel uh, prevents stabilization of microtubules, which in turn prevents cell division. So those are two ways we can start using those anti restenotic drugs and prevent smooth muscle cell proliferation. Then there is a choice to be made as to how much dose we give. 
how much drug do we want to give? How long do we want to give? So there has been varieties of combinations we have learned over the last 10, 15 years as to what may be the ideal dosing. So for example, we had some very high doses given here in a stent called Endeavor, which was very rapidly delivered. And we learned that that probably was not the best strategy. Then we had very low dose of drugs given for a short period of time. Again, probably not the best strategy. I think we have learned that kind of the Goldilocks is where you give it for three to six months, the drug, and you give it at a kind of a medium uh, average dose, and that thing seems to really work well so far. The choice of polymer is very important. I think this is one of the biggest uh, hot topics, so to speak, going forward, because polymer is something which is put on the metal stent, and it is a carrier for the drug molecule. So it protects the drug, it ensures consistent drug dose on the stent, controls amount and timing of release. This is the only purpose of the polymer. However, the polymer has to be mechanically integral. It has to be vascularly compatible. So again, there are a lot of thought which goes into this polymer, which is nothing but a carrier for the drug molecule. There are two types of polymers which are used currently. One is called BioLink, so there is fluorocopolymer, and there is some data to suggest in the second generation stents that this may be thromboresistant. So that may be actually passivating the artery and creating less events down the road. But again, that is highly debatable as of right now. So we have moved on from first generation stents to second generation stents. So let's spend a minute looking at those. So in the first generation stents, Cypher, Texas, and Endeavor, and the second generation, Resolute, Promos, and Zions, we can see that we have moved beyond the stainless steel to certain new alloys. The strut thickness from 140 microns on Cypher, we have definitely come down to uh, low 80s. The polymer thickness has reduced significantly from 13 and 17 down to 4 to 8. The drug choices have moved from sirolimus or paclitaxel to the newer group of olimus drugs such as evrolimus or zotrolimus, and the elution time frame as, as I said, has been kind of refined to, to stop at 90 to 120 days. That's kind of the period we are aiming for now with the second generation stents. So what's the data so far? Second generation stents were introduced in 2007 and now we have enough uh, data almost up to four or five years. So this particular trial looked at both the varieties of stents and without going into every individual trial, I'm just give, gonna give you a little highlight of what Resolute uh, all commerce trial showed. It used Resolute, which is a Zotrolimus stand, and Zions, which is an Avrolimus second generation stand. So we had a TLF or target lesion failure at about 8%, which is kind of an acceptable number nowadays. And then when you followed those patients out to up to four years, your event rates about were 14 to 15%. So definitely much lesser than first generation stands, remember, which were in the high 20s or mid 20s. Uh, at four to five years. So something we clearly can see that we have made an improvement. Stent thrombosis uh, up to four years uh, remain low and acceptable at around 1.5 to 2%. Uh, very late stent thrombosis, which is usually what we define after the first year of a stent implant, also remain low and acceptable at 0.7 to 0.9%. So this is where we stand with our current second generation stents in a snapshot. So because of this, the history of DS has evolved right in front of our eyes. We started with the first generation stents in 2003. Uh, we realized there's a little small dip, and that small dip was because of the clinical realization of late stent thrombosis and late out late events with taxes and, and cipher-like stents. So we basically now have a rebound of the second generation stents where the market penetration is more than 80% and going, and going upwards. However, we can say, well, that's good enough. Um, I don't think it's good enough because I think as much as we have focused in the last 10, 15 years on the safety of our designing of a stent, I think time has come to look more into the efficacy parts, and that's where some new innovative ideas are coming along. We also learn as we look back and reflect upon our second generation uh, drug eluting stents in a trial like Spirit 3. Spirit 3 uses uh, Zions and Taxes, it was versus Taxes, and we realized that yes, there was definitely much less event rates in Zions when you followed those patients out for five years compared to a taxes, so 19 to 12%. However, if you look at it very critically, you realize that gee, we are doing fairly well, but there is about 1.8 to 2% event rate after the first year. So yes, we are doing fairly well. We kind of have, have done a good job out of the first year, but what happens to those patients who have had a metallic second generation stand after the first year, and there, that's where the need for further innovation comes. Because until we innovate, we can never equate ourselves to coronary artery bypass surgery. 
And freedom trial is a good example. I mean, trials after trials in bypass surgery versus ten will show this separation. Where the first year or two, there is really not a whole lot of difference in uh, major uh, endpoints. However, there is a clear separation where the event rates keep on climbing in the PCI and second generation DA stents versus bypass surgery. So this widening gap is, is not serving our patients well. So that's where the need for innovations. Because there are certain issues which are very late with metallic DAs after the first year. And that's where the whole conversation is moving towards the after the first year. Because you can have an uncovered stent struts, which leads to thrombosis. A scaffold, a permanent metallic scaffold, will impair the cyclic pulsatility and vasomotion of the, of the artery. There's chronic inflammation because you've got a late foreign body, which includes a polymer also, which causes reactions and hypersensitivity. There is positive remodeling, which causes late strut apposition. So as the artery enlarges, there is hanging struts inside the vessel, which in turn itself causes thrombosis. Strut fractures are continue to remain a problem. Neoatherosclerosis goes on, and the debate about polymer. Is polymer good? Is it protective? Is it thromboresistant? Or is it actually bad? And it, especially when it comes to long term, because as we know about polymer, polymer can have certain issues long term. So for example, this polymer has swollen. It is swollen, it is basically uh, absorbed water. This polymer is webbed. This polymer is cracked, and this polymer is evolved. Polymer has no remaining function all said and done after the drug release has been achieved. Um, so they all have the potential of being there as a foreign body and causing down the road events, especially after the first year. Because polymer leads to sometimes uncovered struts, hypersensitivity, malaposition, late strength thrombosis, and new atherosclerosis. Again, you can't just blame polymer for everything, but that being said and done, it is all, all said and done an unrequired part of the stent after the drug elution has happened. So is it possible where we can heal that artery, where we can achieve optimal healing, and maybe that will allow us to reduce those event rates after the first year? So what is an optimal healing post-implant? Well, first and foremost, we need a uniform strut coverage, so we cannot have exposed struts. So healing has to happen in the first six months, one year. But not only that, it has to have a very mature neo-intimal layer. And the most important part, to my understanding, is continuous and a functional endothelial layer. Without a continuous endothelial cell layer, you will not be able to achieve appropriate healing because endothelial cells communicate, they stabilize the vessel, they prevent further neointimal proliferation, and that's probably the best barrier against thrombosis. That leads to innovations where we are approaching 2015 and beyond. I think we have another five, 10 years of some fantastic technologies coming down the road. And uh, there are three large categories. Uh, one is obviously the bioabsorbable polymer. So I, you know how I talked about polymer, it probably is unnecessary after the drug is delivered. So why don't we make a polymer which bioabsorbs? So that is one big innovation going on right now. The second is polymer free stents. Well, can we design stents where we can elude the drug but not have to have the polymer? And third, obviously, the giant is a bioabsorbable scaffolds, and let's see where that will take us down the road. So let's talk about first the bioabsorbable polymer stent. So the one, there are varieties of them. In Europe, we have many, many available. In US, we only have one available right now, and it's called Synergy. What it is designed, first of all, the engineers took the struts and make them very thin. So this is a very thin strut uh, stent. And not only that, they put in a biodegradable polymer, but only, if you can see, only on the abluminal side. So there is no polymer towards the lumen. It is only where the arterial wall is. And that's kind of interesting concept. So think about this. This is a polymer which is going to degrade. So the drug is only going to be the everolimus drug molecule will be luting for the first 90 days, which is the first three months, because that's kind of the optimal timing from all said and done. And then the polymer completely reabsorbs at four months. Now there is this concern about, gee, what about when the polymer is still there, do we still have any drug molecule to prevent inflammation and new and restenosis? Well, fortunately, the way the drug eludes, there is actually tissue concentration which lasts beyond the first three months, almost up to 120 days. So all said and done, there is drug concentration in the tissue up to the polymer, complete resorption of the polymer. Because this is a way an abluminally biodegradable polymer uh, stent works. First of all, you take away that polymer after the first four months, so you don't have any long-term polymer exposure. Second, and kind of very unique about this abluminal coating is that there is no polymer on the in, inside the vessel lumen side. 
And because of that, there is complete endothelialization and proper healing of the inside of the vessel wall. I think that is very innovative idea to put only the polymer and the drug on the abluminal side because that's where the restenosis response comes. We don't really need drug where the blood is flowing. It's un completely unnecessary. And the third is obviously targeted drug delivery, again, which happens in the arterial wall side to prevent restenosis and inflammation. Because when we started looking at this and did some bench study, we could actually see that there was a little bit better endothelial cells coverage. So for example, compared to a conformal uh, stent versus an abdominal stent, there was endothelial cell coverage in the upwards of 80%, so 56 versus 86%. And you can actually see that on v cadherin staining that there was de definitely significantly improved endothelial cell function. And as you can see, in the conformal, we have this stop gaps where there's less than 70% versus the abluminal has a much, much better endothelial cell coverage. This is a very interesting slide. Actually, this was presented by Juan Granra, who was one of our fellows and has done a tremendous amount of bench work up in New York now. And he uh, presented this data talking about parastroid inflammation. Inflammation is kind of the cornerstone of how we achieve optimal healing. We got to keep on suppressing inflammation, whether it's acute or chronic. One, we, one thing we already know is with bare metal stents, bare metal stents, you actually have tremendous amount of acute inflammation because of inflammation and restenosis and, and all that kind of stuff. So in the pink, you can actually see with the bare metal stent, tremendously high acute inflammation at 30 days. But what at the same time, if you look at chronic inflammation, which is you know, at about three months, it is almost negligent. It's not even there. So after the bare metal stent has healed, after the first 30 days and going up to three, uh, three to six months, there's hardly any persistent inflammation. Now, what, what we would like to do is compare them with current stents and where we are going with this. So second generation stents and the synergy stents, you can see the acute inflammation is clearly very high in bare metal stents, and acute inflammation is very low in the pink bars in the second generation stents. When you look at the Chronic inflammation, chronic inflammation again remains a little bit high in our sec second generation drug eluting stents, and it's probably going to be the lowest in synergy. And the thought is maybe because the polymer is gone at about 180 days, maybe you are having less and less inflammation in, in a chronic phase. When we did OCD data on the synergy stents, you can actually see adequate healing and complete endothelialization in all those patients, uh, whether it's 30 days, two months, three months, or six months. Uh, and that strut coverage exceeded 70%. Less than 70% of strut coverage is associated with thrombosis of that artery. So that's what we are trying to achieve, and that really has been uh, documented very well with these biodegradable polymer stents. That led to one of the first trials called the EVOL. EVOL was a small trial, more of a dose-finding trial. Uh, it compared PROMUS with Synergy and Synergy half dose. But the takeaway point I want to, add, I want to emphasize today is that look at the four-year data. Again, it's a very small trial, but it is something we learn from every data collect point we collect. And after the first six months, yes, there was increased event rates in, in uh, PROMUS, and there were slightly event, slight event rates in Synergy. But after the first year, there is a pretty much a flat line. And that is what we are trying to achieve. If we can achieve no further TLR after the first year, we can possibly compete with bypass surgery. Maybe we can possibly have long-term healing here. And that's kind of the difference we are looking for. So Evolve was a nice uh, insight into what may be the potential of this particular stand design. And that led to Evolve 2 pivotal uh, trial. Um, this was presented last year, and now uh, this stand is approved based upon this trial. So it took about 800 patients in the PROMUS, which is a, which is a second generation stand, and compared that to Synergy, which is the biodegradable, abluminally coated uh, polymer stent. And the RCD design was, uh, the end, pro end point was for non-inferiority, which included TLF, TLF. And there's going to be a follow-up up to five years. So what did it show at one year? Well, at one year, the absolute event rates were 6.4% with PROMUS and 6.4% in Synergy. So completely no difference there. And because of that, it easily met its non-inferiority margin, which was set at 4.4%. Uh, but again, it was designed as a non inferior study designed for the one-year outcome, and that's what it meant. That allowed for it to be approved in the U.S., which happened earlier this year. But there are some takeaway points from this Evolve 2 trial beyond the approval. 
and the trigger points are, the, let's look at thrombosis because that's kind of on everybody's mind right now. And yes, in the PROMOS group, we had about five, five strength thrombosis in the first year. In the synergy group, we noticed only three and uh, two of them were definite. The first one out of those two definites happened in the first 24 hours, which are often associated with the uh, technique of deployment. And the second happened at six days. So again, after the first week or so, there were no stent thrombosis noted in this particular synergy stent. They, this has led to the next design in US. There are several trials going on worldwide, but in US we are and our institute is gonna be part of the Evolve short tap study, which is basically gonna take all those patients who are high bleeding risk. So whether the patient is very elderly or they have kidney problems or they are on anticoagulation therapy, and we are gonna put in a synergy stand and based upon their clinical outcome, we will decide after three months if we can stop the plavix and just continue them on aspirin. I think that's gonna be a very um, a big step forward and we look forward to participating and enrolling more patients in this particular trial. The second interesting um, innovation which is going on right now is polymer free stents. So this is now going talking about no polymer at all. Can we actually coat the drug molecule and let them release in orderly manner? Because not only polymer allows you to coat the drug molecule, but it also allows the drug elution to be, to be literally uh, customized. Well, can we make actually polymer free stent? So there is a lot of excitement in this particular stent called BioFreedom. Uh, it's a drug coated stent. It is already approved and available in, in Europe. And um, th what they have done is basically they have roughened up roughen up one of the side of the stent. And that is where the drug molecules apparently get attached. And this allows for rapid, rapid drug transfer. So once the stent is deployed, this is where it goes to the arterial wall side and the drug eludes at one month, 30 day period of time. And this possibly allows for shortening of TAP. Now for guys, you may know we use TAP. We were using it for one year. Now we have been going to re use it for only six months in Europe. The operators there often use it only for three months. With this particular drug, with this particular stent, now they have reduced it to actually one month. So there's a lot of excitement about putting this stent. Um, because of this particular drug, Biolimus. Biolimus is very, very lipophilic, so it actually adheres to the arterial wall site very nicely. Mm -hmm. So Leaders Free was this trial which was presented where, again, patients who had high bleeding risk, and um, they compared mm -hmm. that to their bare metal stent called Gazelle. And that was mandated for one month only, followed by single antiplatelet therapy. And so it was using biofilm DCS versus gazelle BMS on high bleeding risk patients. And basically what it shows was the primary efficacy endpoint. Because as, as exciting this science is, you want to make sure that there is no high event rates after at, at least at one year. So at one year or 390 days, um, in the in the biofreedom uh, stand group, we had about 5% event rates versus 9.8 in the bare metal stands. And again, cardiac death, MI, and stroke was 12.9% in bare metal and only 9.4% in the biofreedom stand. So again, a lot of excitement there. But there are certain other, other technologies, like one which we often talk about, I don't know if it's going to see the day, uh, light of day, is drug fill stand. What is a drug fill stand? We, we, basically, you take the stand struts, literally create laser holes, laser cut holes in there, fill those holes with drug molecule, and that hole actually faces again the arterial wall side and the drug eludes over time. Right now it is more and more or less in, the, in, in, in bench work. They're trying to figure out what is the best way to control the drug release. It's a massive technological challenge, but again, this removes the need for polymer. Basically, you're using the stand struts in themselves as well as to store and release that particular drug molecule. Cobra PZF was another stand which we actually participated in this trial. It is kind of innovative. I'm not sure where this will take us, but again, this is designed to reduce the need for antiplatelet therapy. It is basically a metallic stand which is coated with a Polyzin F. Polyzin F is a proprietary material which works like a Teflon. It's like on your cookware where it does not, it basically makes it non-sticky. So again, trials are up and ongoing, but this does not have any drug molecule uh, as part of the stents. Um, Bioabsorbable scaffolds. This is probably the most uh, hot topic in our field today, and uh, let's see where this takes us. Um, because we, we are tired. Sometimes we see patients and angiograms like this where they have so many stents. They all have a metal, full metal jacket. And that just makes patients have a hard time having more procedures and need for bypass and all that kind of stuff. So that has led to bioabsorbable stents. What is an absorbed stent? It has a PLLA backbone. 
semicrystalline. It is circumferential sinusoidal uh, rings, uh, which are connected by linear links. The strut thickness, remember, is 150 microns. So it's much, much thicker. It's almost going back to the cipher day. So that's one of the challenges right now. And they're platinum markers because you can't see them on angiogram. It is an abrolimus drug and PDLL polymer matrix. It's about seven microns in thickness, and there is controlled drug release just like a Zion stent. So this is what it looks like on a macroscopic appearance. Absorbed BVS, as you can see, has much thicker strut compared to a Zion sweet metallic second generation DES. Um, this uses biodegradable material as well as a polymer, and the cross section area you can see is almost twice the size of a Zion stent. So this is where we are today. But again, as we design these stents, we cannot lose our radial strength. This is polymer is nothing but plastic. So compared to metal, it's kind of hard to achieve a very, very thin plastic and maintain the radial strength. Well, we can tell you that on a 3-0 millimeter scaffold or a stent, there is no difference in radial strength compared to a Zion's metal versus an absorbed plastic. So that's good to know to begin with. Because how does an absorb work? Well, first and first, foremost is revascularization, where you're putting in the stent. Then there is restoration, and there is resorption. So revascularization allows for the drug, abrolimus, to elude at three months. And then it restores the blood vessels by losing the mechanical support, eventually the mass loss, at about six to nine months. And over the next 18 to 24 months, it actually resorbs completely. So this is a stand which bioabsorbs, where it takes about one and a half to two years to fully bioabsorb. However, the most, the vast majority of the mechanical integrity and the mass has been already lost at six to nine months. Well, how does it bioabsorb? Uh, water in the surrounding tissue actually penetrates into this uh, polymer matrix, and that makes the polymer chains shorter and shorter. That hydrolysis chews up the amorphous tie chains, and that leads to decrease in molecular weight without altering the radial strength. So as this hydrolysis starts happening, there is no much loss of ma the mass volume of this, and the strength is still having radial strength. However, as time proceeds, more and more tie chains are broken, and that's when the device uh, loses radial strength. Well, as it gets reabsorbed and all this byproduct, well, what is a byproduct? The beauty of this particular backbone of PLLA is that it is byproduct is lactic acid. Well, as we all know, it's linear and it enters the lactate shuffle and lactate metabolism, so it is not, does not cause high inflammation. What happens to those empty spaces? What happens to those spaces where the stent starts, quote unquote, has resorbed? Well, over time, this degrading of polymer initially is first replaced by extracellular matrix, and then it is followed by smooth muscle cells. So what starts off like this, where you have this uh, stent uh, struts you can see inside the vessel wall, basically happens a round circular tube. This is what an OCT uh, looks like at about five years. This is an example of metallic stent, where you can actually see so the metal struts versus a bioabsorbable stent in, in, the, in the ideal world would have a nice, beautiful uh, neo cap. So with that, there were several trials done OUS, but then over the last three years, we finished our absorb three trial, and the data was presented uh, last year. Uh, uh, and uh, let's talk about the absorb three. It is the most important trial probably for this platform, for this technology. And um, we are going to follow those patients up to five years. About 2,000 patients were ran, uh, randomized, two to one. Two patients, for every two patients got absorbed, one got Zions. Primary endpoint was target lesion failure, which was designed for non-inferiority, and there were secondary endpoints of angina, all revascularization, and ischemia-driven TLR, which were designed for superiority. The patients, again, about 1,300-odd uh, patients got the absorb, and about six, 700 patients received the Zion stent. And the primary endpoint reported one year easily met its non-inferiority margin, which is again set at 4.5% uh, by achieving absolute uh, difference of 1.7%. Uh, um, when we dig uh, deep, deeper into this one year TLF components, uh, again, the TLF was 7.8 versus 6.1 at one year, cardiac death 0.6 versus 0.1. Uh, MI 6.0 versus 4.6, and TLR of 3.0 versus 2.5. Again, you can clearly see that all the event rates are slightly higher in the absorb arm compared to the science arm. But again, uh, they do not reach clinically significant uh, endpoints. However, this study was not designed as a superiority study. However, as we uh, started looking into this data, we realized some of the challenges. And one of the biggest challenges was uh, stent thrombosis, device thrombosis. So unfortunately for the absorb arm, 
This is a 150 micron thick strut uh, stand. Uh, we realized the strain thrombosis rates were a little bit higher than what we are normally used to uh, accepting, 1.5%. And Zions is what we are used to now, 0.6 to 0.8%, and it came at 0.7%. Most of those strain thrombosis were early in the first 30 days. Uh, most of them were definitive strain thrombosis. So very, very alarming uh, information. We have uh, seen that. And even the old US European data kind of tells us that the strain thrombosis clearly is a noise we need to get around or we need to figure out how to take care of that. And this strength thrombosis was most remarkably or really high in preference vessel diameters, which is less than 2.25. So as you can see, almost 4.6% strength thrombosis rate versus 1.5% with the Zion. So again, for the lesser, lesser stent, the smaller diameter, it is a massive challenge to use a very big scaffold stent. Now, when you remove that and just look at the large vessel, you can see that strength thrombosis rates are not so bad. So is this something we can learn from? Well, only time would tell. There are some power secondary endpoints of angina, all revascularization, TBR. Well, none of those endpoints which were designed for superiority were met. But again, remember, these stents, these, all the stents I'm telling you guys today about is not designed for one-year differentials. They are more designed for long-term outcomes. Who knows where the future takes us? Because there are certain limitations. Absorb three excluded specific complex lesions. So it can't be used in every patient we know. It is underpowered. Uh, the Zions, which is a controlled uh, device, has some of the lowest strength thrombosis and uh, MACE event rates. BVS, BVS as our absorb is a first generation device. This is our first in human, so to speak, especially the US experience. And it was tried for the first time by most of the trials. So it didn't meet, meet its primary endpoint, and that's why it's awaiting uh, US approval, uh, hopefully in the next couple of months. Um, but again, TLF events were no difference between Zions and Absorb. Um, angina, revascularization, IDTVR were similar, but again, no statistically significant difference in thrombosis. However, a numerically very high number of thrombosis in that particular group. When you compare that with Zion's data from the early days, when you compare the SPIRIT 1, 2, and 3 trial and try to superimpose that with a 3.0 device, you can see that there is definitely um, higher event rates with the Zion's, especially up to the five years, and, and, and possibly lower event rates with the absorbed cohort. Uh, vasomotion also is improved after we have put in a bioobservable stand. Almost more than 80% of those patient arteries at five years in the cohort B group actually showed better vasomotion. So there is some benefit of putting a biosolar stand where the stand, uh, the artery is metal free and probably has a, a resumption of vasomotion. We are actually in Absorb 4 trial as we speak. Absorb 4, again, uh, is a one-to-one -one randomization going back to Absorb versus Zions in about 3,000 patients. And those patients will also be followed up to uh, five years. Uh, angina is going to be one of the primary co points as well as TLF. And only, uh, again, we are in part of enrolling right now, and we'll see how that, where that stress takes us. There are certain theoretical benefits of bioobservable scaffolds. Um, you know, vasomotion will be improved. And as we know, vasomotion is a very key important factor. Patients who have CAD and impaired vas vasomotion do really poor long-term compared to patients who have intact vasomotion. So it would be great to restore vasomotion. However, the argument against is that you have a diffused vessel, you imp improve vasomotion in part of it, does that really help that person? We don't really know, but again, this is a theoretical advantage. The second possible advantage is late lumen enlargement, where the vessel actually enlarges as the bioobservable scaffold gets absorbed. And uh, can it actually lead to lumen enlargement at three, five years? Uh, that's possible second advantage. The third, and probably very promising, is the pulsatility of the vessel, where um, we know that a pulsatile uh, environment is a requirement for smooth muscle cell to be well organized and fully functional. Well, with a metallic stand, that cannot happen. So possibly with a bioobservable stand, it will allow that artery to restore its pulsatility, and that itself will increase the nitro oxide uh, production, and maybe that will prevent restenosis or probably further late thrombotic events, which is what we are hoping. We are seeing NeoCap. NeoCap is the golden tube. And uh, what we are seeing is initially after the struts have been resolved, you kind of see this very uniform, nicely endothelized uh, layer of neo NeoCap. Um, and again, will it be achievable in every patient we do bioobservable? Uh, we'll have to see if that will apply to the vast experience because this technology is booming right now. We have just so many products, so many companies, pretty much everybody, OUS is trying to come up with their own bioobservable scaffold. 
I personally want to say that how we were in DES 10 years ago, maybe this may be 10 years down the road. I would like to believe in that, but only time would tell. The, uh, most of those designs are along aliphatic polymers, PLLA, and uh, they usually have lactic acid and glycolic acid as their byproducts, so they are non-inflammatory byproducts. Uh, but there are also other chemicals, such as polycarbonates and polyanhydrides and metals. So magnesium is already, magnesium hydroxyapatite uh, stands are already used uh, in Europe, and we are trying to see if we can get into the U.S. But again, there's a lot of excitement, so there are just almost 20-odd varieties of uh, companies which are looking into introducing biosol scaffolds. But there remains some challenge. One of them is scaffold shrinkage. Limited post dilatation, we have learned that we got optimally post dilate those particular large strut stents. They are temperature sensitive, so storing can be a problem, shelf life can be a problem. Right now, the way they are designed, they are very, very thick, so they are poorly deliverable, and sometimes they come off the balloon as we are trying to in insert them. There are some perceptive challenges. It's too uh, big a device, so it kind of delivers poorly. The struts are very thick, and plastics don't have enough strength. So, but as I said, in, in, in experienced operators' hand with good amount of experience, you basically can make this happen. But again, use in complex diseases is limited. And the biggest problem to me is the scaffold thrombosis, about 1.5% at about at one year. And I think that remains a big challenge. That being said and done, we are looking at uh, thinner biovascular scaffold stents. Um, I think this is just around the corner. We are going to go into the sub-100 micron space of thickness, and maybe that will allow us to compete better with the second generation in metallic DES. Because as we know, the strut thickness and malapposition creates a really perfect strong for thrombogenicity. The more, the bigger, the, the thicker the strut, and the more the malopause they are, the more likely we're going to have stent thrombosis. So we need to win both of those battles to make a perfect uh, new DES. Because in the idle world, in the idle world, what we'd like to see is going back to that graph where we have increased event rates after the first year. Wouldn't it be great if we can actually flatten this line and make keep the event rates below 10%? closing to 7%. Again, this is a dream. Uh, who knows where this will take us. But if you can achieve this kind of numbers with the PVS or any of this above mentioned technology I've given you, then maybe we can compete with bypass surgery. Maybe we can help those patients long term. Stand technology and how we do interventions have evolved from getting the artery open with the balloon angioplasty to reducing risk stenosis with DES. Uh, now we are into optimizing healing. We are trying to heal those patients' arteries, especially after the first year. And that can be achieved by re reducing lower late event rates, such as stent thrombosis and TLR. Maybe, maybe, maybe we can reduce the need for prolonged tap and reduce risk of neoarthrosclerosis. Thank you very much.